Hey gang, it's Wednesday. It's hump day happy hour. And we're the dentist in the know. I'm Chad Duplantis. And right here is Dr. Jennifer Bell. Hi. Dr. Jeff Horowitz is putting out fires in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, but he'll be with us shortly, hopefully. We have a great guest for you tonight. But most importantly, we're dentists. And our job is to bring you into the know. So as we mentioned earlier in the interview or the discussion that we had, there's certainly an uptick of COVID in the U.S. and 80% of those cases are the new variant, the BA.5. Um, and I don't know about you, but I'm certainly experiencing uh, some of that uptick in our practice. Really more patients just calling in for cancellations for being genuinely sick. So hopefully this will run its course pretty quickly. Um, I know Chad had mentioned he had one individual that it did end up in the hospital, but generally speaking, and very anecdotally, uh, not seeing as serious of a degree of illness. Um, so hopefully folks will be recovering okay, and maybe we can get through this next wave relatively unscathed. Another interesting development kind of coming out this week, we talked about the McCarran-Ferguson Act back in uh, 2021, that's when they repealed a lot of the legislation around anti-competitiveness and, and uh, collusion within the insurance companies. Well, a letter went out just last week to the Department of Justice asking for an update, which I find enlightening and interesting. Uh, and, and at least there's some follow-up for many of the legislators that originally proposed and put forth the bill that got it passed through both the Senate and the House. Uh, wanting to hold ultimately everyone accountable to the legislation, which in reality, isn't that what we always want from bills that move through? We want some level of accountability to ensure that those things that are being voted upon actually have some application in the real world. So I'll keep you posted. They have a few weeks to respond, I believe through the end of August, to respond back to those individuals who had requested an update. Um, and so hopefully we'll get some additional information about um, where changes have been applied and what observations and protections they've put in place as they've repealed the McCarran-Ferguson Act. So hopefully we'll get a good update on that. The HPI statistics that the ADA has been collecting over the last couple of years continue to come out on a regular basis. Always interesting to see how our colleagues are feeling about their current profession and challenges they're having. Interestingly, I, I thought this was kind of a neat statistic. Almost half of dental practices now offer health insurance. That was a part of one of the statistical um, requests that they had in this week's survey. And I that was actually a lot higher than I thought it would be. Um, and then those who aren't currently offering it did cite cost as being probably the primary driver for why they have not instituted it into their benefits package yet. Again, dentists continue to struggle to find dental assistants and dental hygienists to fill open positions. Four out of every 10 dentists are still looking for DAs to come into the practice and generally recruiting hygienists has continued to be a problem for the profession. And sadly, overall, dental professionals still have a pretty low confidence on the economic recovery. While it didn't go down week over week with the statistical analysis, it certainly hasn't moved up either. And I think that's a pretty consistent reflection with the general population as well, and certainly most small business owners. And lastly, as a part of our news tonight, it's a plea, a plea from dentists in the know. We don't often ask our viewers for many favors. In fact, we get on every week faithfully and deliver great solid content at a very low cost to our viewers. In fact, free. All we ask is every now and then you throw us a little bit of a bone to say what a good job we're doing. And today we're asking for you, if you haven't subscribed or downloaded our podcast recently, get on your Apple Podcast subscribers, Spotify, whatever you're using your podcast currently, you know, wherever you're consuming podcasts currently, and look us up. We've got an amazing amount of content. It's consolidated. So if you like our show, but not all the banter and the news crap that comes along with it, the podcast is consolidated down to our guests and just the great content that they've been bringing to us for over two years now. You can subscribe, you can give us a rating, and you can also give us a review. 
this consistent feedback from our listeners gives us valuable information to continue to provide podcasts that are worthy of you, you as an audience, but also continue to move us up in the rankings so that other dentists can join in our fun and in the community. We want to be able to continue to provide this content to you at no cost. And in order to do that, we just need a little recognition from our viewers and listeners every week. We thank you so much for continuing to be a part of our community and letting us be a part of your life for the last couple of years. So if you don't have anything to do in the next hour while you're listening to Dr. Walsh wow us about bioceramics and endodontics and resorption, you can be subscribing to our podcast. And with that, I'll turn it back over to my friends. Great news segment as always, but without further ado, let me introduce our guest. And this is, uh, this is, this is kind of like special to me because this guy and I have become really great friends over the past couple of years. And it's because of the way that he treats my patients, uh, our patients of our practice, mine and Dr. Kirkham's, but it's also because education really brought us together. We were talking about, we were really nerding out one day and talking about biomaterials and bioceramics and everything. And then I started realizing what his research was involved in. And so of course we had to do it on the golf course, you know, and we, we've spent a lot of time together. We've lectured together. He is skyrocketing in the lecture field, but Dr. Ryan Walsh went to the university of Iowa. Then he did his endodontics residency at Baylor here in Dallas. He teaches in endo and he teaches dentists and endodontists around the world. He was just in Spain a couple of weeks ago and his main focus is in bioceramics. So here we are, Dr. Ryan Walsh. I uh, feel like I haven't seen you in forever, uh, but good to see you, buddy. Yeah, it's, it's been a, a whole three or four days since you outdrove me on the ninth there. So yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> First Sorry, last subject, time. but it's it's all right. It was well deserved. It was well deserved. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you, thanks for having I know on, that, thanks for I having know me on. Cheers, cheers to everybody. Oh, thanks, cheers. JB. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. 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 What were you saying, JB? I know that y'all have become really great friends, and particularly on the golf course. But would you be chapped when Ryan does get picked for the Senior Live Tour before you do? It won't well, happen. It, oh it, no! As long no. as he throws me on the bag, I think it'll be fine. Yeah. It Fine. won't happen because Ryan's commitment is not there yet. Okay. <laughs> I just want to make that clear. He has uh he has two twin year old, two twin two year old year olds, huh? Two twin year olds, two twin two year old daughters, and then he has a four almost five year old daughter. So his time is spent there. So they have to get to the point where they can pour their own cereal before his commitment sets in. But I don't I don't razz him for that. So yeah, yeah, you'd have you'd have to talk to the boss about that one for sure. Yeah. The <laughs> only thing that I garnered from that particular comment is he's a lot younger than you, so he has time. <laughs> That's all I heard. Yeah, maybe We're just a, few a generation years. apart. It's, it's I mean, unless he got started late in life, which is possible, and I'm not judging, but what I'm probably assuming <laughs> is he's right on time. Yeah. Yeah. Why did you have to shave the beard? Damn it. You even look younger. <laughs> you look more younger now. So Goodness. Ryan, my first question for you is, um, and I've never asked you this, so I'm interested. Okay. What was your interest in endo? What, what made you, when, and why did you decide that you wanted to be an endodontist? Yeah. I mean, it, it takes a special type of crazy to want to be, be an endodontist. And I, I just happened to fit the bill. Uh, it, it actually started with my mom getting a root canal. Uh, so she was getting a root canal from the, the endodontist back home in Sioux City, Iowa. And uh, Dr. Randy Breeden, he's no longer practicing, but uh, got a root canal from him. And uh, my mom's chit-chatting uh, under the rubber dam, of course. And uh, <laughs> come to find out, he'd been a, a instructor at UMKC for about 20 years. And so uh, he and I, you know, she told him I was going to dental school. And so I swung in and observed and one thing led to another. I became his assistant and all my time away from college and did that for, for two summers and all the breaks. And uh, after being around that, I, I really knew that endo was the, was the way to go. I think like a lot of, uh, a lot of us dentists, you know, going into dentistry, I thought orthodontics was going to be my calling. And uh, as soon as I got into endo and was able to observe that and get my fingers wet, it was, it was a sealed deal. Did that but, ever, sorry, did, did that ever change? Cause 
if all you had seen prior to dental school was endo, then I totally get the focus. Yeah. And then when you get exposed to, you know, all facets of dentistry, did you find that waiver at all? Or was it really hardcore endo all the way? Yeah, it was pretty hardcore endo all the way. Yeah. Uh, you know, they say come in with an open mind. So I tried to be very open about that, but they also say, you know what you don't like way before you know what you like. Yeah. And, uh, pros and pouring models and uh, yeah, doing crowns was just not my jam. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Patients ask if I'll do their crown sometimes and you know, I'll be respectful and say, honestly, you don't really want me to do your crown. You That's know, what I say about Rick. Not now. my area of expertise. <laughs> <laughs> you should probably go see Chad for that. Yeah. So, and, and, and truth be told, uh, Ryan's lovely wife, Lindsay is also a dental professional <laughs> and, <true>. um, she's <laughs> undergoing the Panky curriculum right now, but, yeah. um, I'm just glad that Lindsay practices like you know, forever away so that Ryan can't refer all of his unclaimed <laughs> endo patients <laughs> to Lindsay. But, uh, but no, L Ryan's wife's a fantastic uh, dentist as well. So um, I wanted to share that also. Yeah, that, that Panky, uh, I've been to a couple of the Panky group things now, and that's, that's really engaging. I mean, if, if you're not excited to be a dentist after listening to some of that stuff and nerd out with some of those people, man, it's a it, it's really cool as well. Again, talk about foundation and education, uh, about dinks. And yeah, I, I feel like there's a lot of parallels between uh, what you guys talk about, what you're trying to focus on and, and trying to educate dentists and, and what Panky's doing as well. And again, I'm an endodontist. So, you know, VDO and VDR are, are uh, very, very foreign terms to me that I've since washed out of my brain, but uh, very cool perspectives. Do you have a perspective on where endo has gone over the last, we'll say decade? Because I do think, yeah. you know, it, it is changing. And even the things that my endodontists are recommending and doing look different than what we were doing 12, 15 years ago and, and the things we were talking about. So how long have you practiced, remind me? Uh, let's see, nine years. Okay. So that's probably pretty perfect. What have you seen in the transition over the last decade? And then probably what were you taught in dental school as comparison, right? Because yeah. there's usually some variant there. No, I think uh, when I was in dental school, the big question was, well, where do you think endo is going to be around in 10 years with implants? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that was kind of the big the big question. That was everybody's question at the time. But uh, I mean, I shoot, I, re I refer patients for implants every single day in my practice career. So I, I think there's absolutely uh, room in the sandbox for everybody. But I think endo has changed a lot. Uh, bioceramics really started coming out when I was in residency, when I was in dental school, kind of really phasing into that. And uh, so I got on, I was kind of on the front end of some of the bioceramic things. And I think that's changed a lot of things that we can do predictably in endodontics. Uh, and now working with, with the folks at Vista as well, uh, the things they can do in restorative dentistry are just mind blowing. Um, as well as being you know, conservative, uh, trying to be, minimally invasive endodontists and you know microscopes are pretty routine here in the u.s but having talked to my colleagues all over the world they're not and so as mm -hmm. microscopes become a, a big routine player i mean uh, i think there's a lot of things changing from that from that perspective a lot of subtle things a lot of uh, you know things that seem trivial but uh, uh i think it's really making a big uh, a big impact on how we how predictable we can be with endodontics and, uh, and treat our patients well, help keep teeth, and again, maintain those teeth as long as we can until they need to be extracted. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's uh, you, you brought up a lot of really interesting points, but how do you, we're going to get into bioceramics in just a second, but how do you answer a patient? Because I'll tell you what I say in a minute, but when a patient asks about what was that Netflix thing that came out a while back about the root cause? Is that yeah. what it was called? Do you get questions about that still? Sure. Not, not as many as, as, uh, as we did right out of the gate. Uh, as a matter of fact, Catherine Luce, one of uh, uh, our friends, Chad, you met her down in, uh, in New it Orleans. Was. Yeah. yeah. Uh, she sent me uh, a message right as she was watching it with a little screenshot. She's like, get ready for this. So <laughs> uh, yeah, I still get some questions about it, but you know, I think, everybody's entitled to their own opinion. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I think the, the data in endodontics is overwhelmingly, or it overwhelmingly speaks for itself. I mean, we have thousands and thousands and thousands of papers published every year in different journals around the world. And we have for the last 50, 50 years or so, 
And I mean, I think if there were truly these systemic concerns or you know, putting somebody on the spectrum or doing something like that, I, I really think, you know, the the cat would be out of the bag by now. So I'm not, I'm not trying to crush anybody's uh, opinion, but on the same token, obviously I'm an endodontist and, and have based my whole career around this and, and really feel strongly that, yeah, that this is, this is the right thing to do. I don't think I'm putting patients in, in harm by doing root canals for them. No. And, and, you know, it's funny. I always tell patients this, I'm like, you know, because patients do reference it from time to time. And I think the most recent was about a month ago, a patient asked about it. Uh, when I, when I was making a referral and I said, you know, I said, if you look back, we probably all saw that when it was released, what, five, six, seven years ago, maybe, maybe sooner. I don't, I can't remember. Yeah. I, I, I can't either, but I said, how many docu-series are there on Netflix or any of the other, uh, streaming services that have been pulled due to inaccuracies? Sure. And I said, there's not that many. This is one of the few that's been pulled. I said, so, um, you know, I think that there's, that's, that's something that's to be said for that video is that, you know, it's gone. You can't find it anymore, you know? So there was obviously something that they were up against that, that, that wasn't necessarily true. And so, um, I have the utmost faith in what you all as a profession do. Um, but more importantly, let's talk a little bit about what you do, because I think um, you have really changed my opinion on how to treat internal resorption. Jennifer, Jeff and I were doing a series for um, for Dr. David Rice, and I think I had two or three internal resorption cases in oh. there that now I have the utmost confidence in because of the way that you're treating them. So. Let's talk a little bit about that because that's a really hot topic. And I think there's, there's a, a lot more internal resorption throughout the pandemic than we had ever seen before. So, um, I don't know if we're becoming better diagnosticians or our radiology is better or, or what it is. I think Brett Robinson said it really well. He said, I think it's gotta be something in the water because yeah. I just feel like people are developing this left and right. And, you know, we still don't have a good concrete cause to, you know, put our thumb on it and say, yep, this is it. Or uh, we're actually in the process of publishing a paper right now in the JOE of uh, uh, correlating factors uh, over three offices here in the DFW Metroplex. And I think we have around 500 cases or so, and there's really no good correlation. So it's not just from my office, but it's from a couple other very rep uh, reputable endodontists in the area. And, and we're just not able to draw those correlations and say, hey, you had braces, you're getting resorption. Or, you know, you, you had highly fluoridated water, you're getting resorption. You know, we don't know. Interesting. So what, uh, tell us about what's changed that's increased your confidence in treating these cases. Do you want me to pull up any slides? Sure. You can pull up that resorption slide if you want. I'm okay, going to so miss seeing real, your pretty much. Real quick. Let me just say to our podcast listeners. That's one of us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, our podcast listeners, if you, if you would like to see the videos, I'm just going to selfishly refer you to our YouTube channel where all of the imagery that we're talking about can be seen, but we're going to talk through this. So, uh, is this the first slide that you want to go to, Ryan? Well, go, go to the, keep going a couple, not the, the third slide. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Okay. Yeah. Hey, well, he's queuing that up, Ryan. Are you seeing a difference between internal and external, or is it all all resorptions fall under the same classification, and and the phenomenon or uptick is is equally in both categories? Yeah, I think um, I think we're there's a lot of classifications of resorption. I just start there, you know, internal and external are just two huge, you know, it's you know which fork in the road are you taking? But yeah. I feel, uh, you know, classic internal resorption where you see the canal just balloon out. You know, I don't see really an uptick in that necessarily. Same with true external resorption where, uh, you know, you just see an eroded part of the tooth, or if you take a CT, it's all external. It just kind of stays like that. What? at least in my practice, in, in our practice, my partners and I are seeing a huge uptick in what we call uh, cervical resorption or extra canal invasive cervical resorption or extra canal resorption. It's, there's a, a slew of terms, but I think the easiest one is just cervical resorption. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like this x-ray that you're seeing where you see kind of a moth eaten pattern yeah. uh, right around the, the collar of the tooth. So I think I'm seeing a, a huge uptick in that particular type of resorption 
compared to all others. And, and again, I, we don't have any causative factors to, to even put together the, the only factor that had somewhat of a correlation, but absolutely not causative was having braces. But we saw so many people in this study that, that didn't have braces, mm-hmm. had plenty of teeth with resorption. So, uh, tell us about this case. That is sure. interesting. Yeah. So this, this lady came to me back in, uh, uh, 2018, it completely asymptomatic. She just went into her general dentist and, uh, just for a routine exam for a yearly exam. And they took radiographs and noticed resorption. Uh, I, I think this is the case a lot. Most, uh, yeah, I would feel very confident saying most of the cases I get are asymptomatic. Uh, part of that's the way this resorption works is that once it makes a little purchase point in the external uh, tooth or root surface, it just tunnels inside. And interestingly, it doesn't affect the unmineralized tissue. So in other words, it doesn't go right into the pulp and drill a hole. It just surrounds the pulp and kind of this webbing or tunnel-like work. And so until that external surface breaks through, kind of like caries, you know, many times they're going to be asymptomatic until mm-hmm. it's exposed to the oral environment. Uh, but thankfully here, the, the, the GP caught it at the, at the radio or at the uh, the recall exam and sent her over for, for endodontics. And, uh, yeah, I'm always really upfront with these patients and say, you know, it's kind of like a throwing a hail Mary. We really don't know what's going on. Uh, since I've been treating more of these over the past few years, I've really seen good success rates at, at one to three year recalls, which is fantastic again, because you, you don't even know what caused it, let alone specifically how to treat it. And, um, you know, the traditional way was put, uh, trichloracetic acid on these approach them surgically open it up, remove it, trichloracetic acid and restore it. But I think, uh, bioceramics have really allowed me to do things that I don't think we could have done predictably before. And, and partially because that's the, the bioactivity inside of these bioceramics. And, you know, I think I'm able to do a lot of these non-surgically treat them internally and then tell the patient, Hey, this was kind of a, a Hail Mary to begin with. If we see it continuing to develop, we can always come back for a surgical approach or uh, the, the next option would be to extract it and replace it with an implant. Uh, but out of the you know, nearly 30 cases with at least a year recall, uh, we only have uh, one true failure where the resorption continued. Uh, we had one where it was a, a structural failure of the tooth, the tooth fractured. Uh, and you know, that's not, in my mind, that's not out of the ordinary or not to be, mm-hmm. you know, not surprising, I should say, but this, we, we just opened it up and you can see in the, in the photo there through the, through the microscope that, you know, it looks like coral, you know, you mm-hmm. can see little patches that look like little tunnels going through there. And, uh, that's really what it looks like when you get inside some of these teeth and there's just a whole bunch of little flaky corally tissue. And, uh, my treatment these days is to approach it just like you would a root canal and then internally remove as much as you can with a, with an ultrasonic or a slow speed. I prefer ultrasonic. Uh, and remove as much as you can. And sometimes that creates a perforation. And thankfully, if we're creating a perforation, we know it's happening. It's happening under rubber dam and you know, relatively, uh, uh, I don't want to say sterile. I think that's an inappropriate word, but a, a safe environment there. Controlled that, environment. Controlled environment. Beautiful. That Then we know we're not introducing a whole lot of saliva and external bacteria that, that I think would maybe compromise these teeth. And uh, having that perforation, putting bioceramics, you know, I, I like to use uh, Neo sealer flow and, uh, Neo putty from Avalon biomed. And that's just a, a personal bias. I've been working with them for the last 12 years doing research with them. And uh, I've done a lot of the fundamental research. So I really have seen these products work. And, uh, I think they're, they're critical for stimulating the body to heal its native conformation tissues at the exact location. So, uh, to answer your question, what's changing, I think the bioceramics and, and the, the restorative aspects that we have in these materials are really really revolutionizing how I approach these cases. How- okay. So you open it up, you ultrasonicate it, you irrigate it. Yeah, mm-hmm, absolutely. And then you place a bioceramic sealer in there. Well, flip to the next slide. I think I showed the okay. observation here on the next slide. So really what we've done here is you can kind of see little stages. If you look, you can see the apical four or five millimeters, and then there's a break or a little line of changing materials. So that apical four or five millimeters where I know there was not resorption, I filled that with uh, with Neo Sealer Flow and Gutta Percha. Above that, coronal to that, where you can kind of see it looks like it's starting to get very close to the external surface, I placed Neo Putty because I can adapt the putty to the outside surface of that tooth internally. So I know that I'm having a bioceramic in contact with 
uh, the external surface or the bone in the periodontium. And we know from our, our previous studies that the body will regenerate those tissues. Uh, it'll even regenerate cementum over the top of the root surface in some cases. So why not allow the body to heal itself in, in scenarios like this? And then more coronally, I put the uh, Fuji extra, Fuji nine extra, because I know we'll get epithelial attachment. Uh, and I, I just really like the Fuji products for that. And again, I don't have any affiliation with them or anything. It's just something that, that we've been using. And uh, I just don't carry Geristore in my office. And I have seen fantastic uh, junctional epithelial attachment to these glass ionomers. So I think that's the perfect way to, to seal it uh, coronally or what's exposed to the oral environment. Do you have a methodology? So let's say I'm the GP who sees this on radiograph one, asymptomatic. What's the decision paradigm for intervening versus monitoring? And, and how do we sort of gauge, you know, I always want to give patients options, but as you know, asymptomatic patients are a little less inclined to do sure. things and spend money when it doesn't hurt. So yeah. you know, let's go through a monitoring versus intervention. And from your perspective, if this patient walks in day one and it's the first mm -hmm. time we've seen you know, this, this is a much more dramatic presentation, I think, but if you just start to notice change, how do you decide when to jump in? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's really a, the million dollar question, mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, if you can get historic radio radiographs, fantastic. You know, that way you can at least say this was not there six months ago and mm -hmm. it is now, or I've had several come from general dentists where they say, I saw a spot two years ago and I've been very closely monitoring. And now it's finally starting to grow. And so I think if you're seeing the progression, uh, that's a good time to treat because we know that the resorption can go from zero to a hundred and, and make it a non-restorable tooth in less than six months. And that's kind of the, the head scratcher conundrum of, well, hey doc, I brush and floss. I see my dentist every six months. Why is this happening? Or why do I have to have a tooth extracted? And yeah, that's frustrating because you know now what do we do? Do we go to every three month, every three month recalls with full mouth series? I think that's a little aggressive, but yeah. yeah, it's, it's just a hard time or a hard decision to make. And, you know, most of the time I'm as an endodontist, I'm seeing this just a snapshot in time. And many times these are new patients to the dentist, otherwise they would have been monitored already. And so a lot of these, you know, talk to the patient and, and be realistic with the options, you know, no treatment extraction, and I can help you with the gray area everywhere in between, uh, but really kind of throw it in their ballpark and, you know, say, you know, what type of risk tolerance do you have? And, you know, I, I've actually been showing some of my my patients other cases and say, hey, this is really similar to yours. I'm seeing this lady back for three years and we still have great success. Can't guarantee it, but this is what, what the future could look like. And I think being honest with patients, uh, people really want to save their teeth. I mean, I think we're all in the business together and uh, people want to save their natural teeth if they can, even if it's a uh, a little bit of a Hail Mary pass sometimes, you know, hey, if some, for some, for some folks, it's, you know, two or three years is a success. You know, for me, I'd obviously like it to last much longer, but yeah, that's kind of how Can I pitch it. The success paradigm similar for, let, let's say these uh, unknown trigger cases where we don't really know why resorption took place versus a trauma case, for instance. Um, and when you treat those, do you see that the long-term prognosis is similar using bioceramics or stem cell regeneration or whatever it happens to be at the time? Um, or do you find trauma cases are a little more challenging, less predictable? In my hands, it feels like trauma cases are less predictable. You just don't know when they're going to wake up and become yeah. a problem. But for sure, I didn't know if you saw the same and or when you actually do intervene and treat, are you finding similar success value in, in treatments? it's somewhat hard to say, and I'm not trying to be elusive or no, no, a question, but a, a lot of times I don't see this resorption in trauma cases. Sometimes, sometimes for sure you do. Um, you know, if, what, what I think is really hard to treat are avulsed teeth because we have this protocol that, you know, uh, that the AAE recommends and that's the best we have. So that's what we follow. But the type of resorption where it's external root resorption from an avulsed tooth and it just, you know, literally erodes the tooth outside in. I think those are the most unpredictable. Like you said, it can be normal, normal. And then all of a sudden this 45 year old who caught an elbow when they were in high school basketball, uh, it just blows up and, and condemns the tooth. Um, 
but yeah, I, I guess I don't really have a good answer for you there. Yeah, I was I, just curious. I, I is, pulling that data as, as time goes on. So ho yeah. hopefully in the next couple of years, I can accurately answer that. That'd be wonderful. Mm, perfect. Then we'll have all of our problems solved. Fingers crossed. Yeah, right. Yeah. So JB, you were asking a question earlier that I think is, is really just something to kind of, as general dentist, for us to really just pause upon for a second is that, you know, we're all going to have cases like these in our practice. And I think that we're all going to stumble across one that just happens to sneak into a bite wing. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh my God, when did this happen? You know, how did this happen? And, you know, you get this, this feeling of guilt where, you know, the old, when, when I graduated from dental school, which was several years before you, JB, and, and several way before Walsh did. Wait a uh, minute. Yeah. <laughs> But I'm, I'm unsubscribing. Yeah, I don't know if they had but credit when I graduated from dental school, internal resorption was an external resorption were idiopathic. There was no guaranteed treatment. Um, you know, it didn't really matter when you found it because we didn't know the predictability of it because we didn't have everything that we have now. And nowadays, when I see a case like this, to your point, when when is the time to treat? Yeah. I feel confident with the materials that we have now to say, you know what, I think it's worth at least a visit to Dr. Walsh. He's done several cases regarding this. And let's see what his thought process is at the stage that you're at, whether it's treatable, whether it's not. And I think over the past year or two, I've sent you probably eight to 10 cases. And I think sure. one of them um, who actually is a really good friend's wife that it would just kind of like, was like, Oh my God, where did this come from? And she's, it, it's number 24, 25. She's, she's probably going to lose it. And, and it's kind of like, you know, there's, but you know, you just, you just stumble across it and you just treat them the best you can. But the flip side of it is, is that we've worked together on patients where, their dentist just kind of found it and was just kind of like, eh. And the, the patient was like, that's not a good enough answer. And they lost confidence in the yeah. dentist because the dentist had no answer for it, really an apathetic response to it. And, you know, maybe that's the way that they were trained in school because that's what it was. Um, but we, we've actually inherited a couple of those cases together as well. And the ones that we've worked on together, I've seen great success with. So if you see something like this, find an endodontist that's working a lot with bioceramics that's treated a lot of these cases. And I think that you'll be surprised at how many of these are treatable from what we used to think that they weren't treatable. They were just kind of wait, watch until it hurts. And then you're getting an implant. I, I totally agree. Uh, that's one of the, the cases where you just, Hey, I, I don't know what's going on here, but I, the only treatment I would recommend is extraction, but you know, hold it and ride that horse as long as you can. And if, if you become symptomatic or you start developing, you know, evidence of a, a periapical pathosis, then yeah, go ahead and get it extracted. But heck, for all we know, that might be there the rest of her life with, with resorption, just sitting as is. So those are all right. I have another burning question. Shoot. So if we can use bioceramics to repair, and then like you said, using bioceramics, the glass ionomers, which you can get epithelial attachment. So for an external resorption, let's say on a number eight or nine, which I hate to see because, you know, it's the classic lesion just below the CEJ in order to do your surgical approach, as you mentioned, means aesthetically, this is a nightmare from here, here on out. Yeah. Very difficult to repair surgically without ruining the aesthetic presentation. Do you think an internal access with bioceramics changes the prognosis of or, or the clinical predictability of what we can offer patients now. Yeah, I think you just hit the nail on the head. The clinical predictability. Uh, I really think that's it. And, and something that bioceramics affords us that, you know, we had the, the technical skills to do this. Right. We've had the technical skills all along. I don't think that's ever been the question. Um, I don't know if, if any of you have ever heard of David Witherspoon. Uh, he's yeah. an amazing, amazing endodontist. And, and he's given us some, some talks at study clubs and, you know, he, again, he's an international guy, international lecturer about how he surgically repaired these. And he has incredible recalls, like 10, 20 year recalls on these cases. And um, obviously that's, that works. It, it's incredibly successful. Um, and so I'm just, 
you know, again, trying to revamp my mindset of, can I approach some of these internally without ever having to go externally right. because of the material we have today? So not necessarily my expert, my expert skill to handle get it. Yeah. More seeing if we can remove it, if we can create a biological response or I guess the way I think about it, stimulating the body to heal or stimulating that biological response that's already there. It just needs a little help to get, you know, to get the, the full nine yards or the full 10 yards. That, yeah. Cause we've definitely, I mean, kind of like the case you're referencing, we've had those cases where if you could do a bioceramic internal approach, you might could at least attempt to save the tooth. Yeah. But I feel like I'm just in the, well, okay, well, when the crown completely, you know, comes off of the tooth, which is where we're headed, then call me and we'll do the, like, if you don't want to do it now, cause it's not hurting, you know, and that kind of thing. And I don't have any other great options. I guess call me when it's decapitated itself and then we'll put an implant in there and we'll go, go on. I, you know, I don't know what else to do. At this no, that, uh, Chad and I worked on a case where it was 24, 25 and 24 had non-restorable resorption. I mean, it was blown up. 25 had minor resorption. And so we treated 24, uh, excuse me, 25 endodontically got the periodontist involved. He extracted number 24. Chad did this beautiful, beautiful Maryland bridge or the folks from Iowa called a Maryland, Iowa bridge. Oh, yeah. uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, beautiful. And what a, what a great service. We call them Carolina bridges. We've got our own over here. Okay. <laughs> Gotcha. Everybody's got there. <laughs> hey, Chad, hit the next slide and we can show the show the follow up here. Yeah. This, this is just CT showing the, the pre op and then a three year recall. Um, so, again, talking about clinical response, there's no progressive resorption. The, the level of the bone is approximately in the same area. And we have uh, epithelial attachment to that uh, Fuji 9 on the lingual. I mean, that's crazy. To me, that's a. I mean, if this were my tooth and I, I was sure I was going to lose it and somebody tried to save it and I'm uh, getting a three-year recall, I mean, I, I'd be tickled pink. Mm -hmm. And again, there, you know, not everyone is, is, is like this, but uh, I think by far and away, like I said, I think we're, we're at one true failure where it's reverted itself and, and started to erode the tooth. But um, time will tell as we continue to gather data. You know, uh, we're getting, as we're getting close, I want to, I think it's really important that we talk. You know, when we were, Ryan and I did a presentation together in May and um, we called it crown down a novel approach to the yeah. GP endo relationship. But one of the places that I've gained a lot of confidence in Ryan through our professional relationship is, is from a restorative approach. So, you know, we know everything from the apex up. That's, that's all you but you're utilizing some newer materials right at the coronal portion. And tell us a little bit about that. Maybe, you know, get, get a little deep on the, don't get deep, but maybe a little four or five S five talk. Oh yeah. You like the four or five S five, huh? Ooh, yeah. It's not so fancy. <laughs> you know what it is. I, do you know what four or five S five is JB? No. Okay. It's you do, but trust me, that's me coming across the way you are right now. Cause I had no idea what four five S five was, but you'll know in just a second. Uh, well, four five S five is, is a bioglass. Uh, and I had the the pleasure of, of meeting and working with Dr. John Kanka, uh, down in, in, in May. And uh, what a cool guy. First of all, it was, it's always fun to nerd out with a fellow nerd and, uh, scroll to the next slide there, Chad, or the, the very yeah. last one shows those composite discs. Um, I mean, I think this says it all, right? Truly, I think this is, is what it's about. So I didn't know that there were bioactive composites. As a matter of fact, I kind of thought the opposite. Composite is very non-bio-friendly, right? Cytotoxic. Uh, it's not tissue-friendly. It's so technique-sensitive. Um, it, you know, it, it just doesn't seal well. You have, to, you have to put a bonding agent that's technique-sensitive to hold it, this plastic material to the tooth. And so I, was, I've always, I always had that mindset from dental school. But looking at this, uh, this is regen from, from Vista Apex and uh, the on the left. On the right is just a traditional composite. So what they've done is they took these two composite discs, placed them in uh, artificial saliva. And what you're seeing on the left where it kind of looks like um, speckled ice, that's actually calcium phosphate depositing on the surface of that composite. So it's literally interacting with the, uh, with the surrounding tissues. And ultimately it's stimulating hydroxyapatite formation. So if you want to think of it, 
at least how I think of it in my mind is that if I'm doing a deep restoration, like a, a DO or an MO that needed that be, or needed endo because of the depth of that, well, now I can use a composite with a lot of confidence because now at that interface between the tooth and the composite, definitely by far the weakest point, the most moisture sensitive area of the entire tooth, I could potentially stimulate hydroxyapatite formation. You know, what I immediately thought of in Kanka's, I hopefully he's not listening because he'd kick me if he heard me say this, but the original uh, alloy restorations that actually formed that corrosion and, and it increased the, uh, or decreased the gap between the restoration, that's what I think of with this material. I mean, if you're getting calcium phosphate deposition from artificial saliva, well, not only do we have our saliva in our mouth, but we have gingival curricular fluid. We're continuously replenishing this phosphate source. Uh, to me, it's a, it's a no brainer to be using uh, bioactive composites like this. And uh, since, since we've been uh, doing a little bit of research on this, and since we've been using it in our practice, both my partners and I routinely, routinely use this at the depth of our restoration. Uh, or if there's any potential compromise, any potential area where it may be exposed or hard to get a crown on. And now I can tell some of my GPs to, hey, just put your crown on my composite. I'm very, very comfortable with that. I think the uh, the biological response to you dropping it below is going to be poor and potentially create bio biologic width issues. But here, just put it right on top of the composite. And let it let the composite do its thing. Yeah, that's really interesting. So I I learned I was like, what's this four or five S five stuff? It's the bioglass in Regen mm -hmm. and then Regen Flow. And you know we are getting a biological response. Uh, sorry, family's coming over, and um, <laughs> my father in law's dog is going nuts. Um, Hold on. Welcome to Keller, Texas, folks. That's my <laughs> life. That's that's our bonus dog. Um, so anyhow, uh, four or five S five uh, active ingredient bioglass within the uh, Regen materials, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, Ryan, man, our time is is coming to a close, and I don't want to keep everybody, but fantastic, JB. Really appreciate it. You yeah. I always learn on our show. I, if nothing else, I get CE every week, <laughs> listening and learning. So thanks yeah, for coming. Yeah, on. absolutely. Such a such an honor and pleasure to be on after watching it for, I guess, the, as you would say, a long time watcher, first time presenter. There you go. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> thank you guys so much for all you do and for uh, for all of us dinks out there and uh, continuously bringing great new content. Love it, love it, guys. Keep it up. Appreciate. Well, it. I'd love for you to post some cases. <clears throat> uh, over the next few weeks if you would. I can get done here yeah take your time man we'd really appreciate it because i think it is it is really important to have your perspective amongst our group as well and and have people open their eyes to the wonder of endodontics so thanks for being with us bud absolutely guys thanks so much Iron. Yeah, thanks. Have a good week. take care all right see you soon um that was pretty awesome loved it yeah that was that, that was, was fun really to geek out for a little bit on that it really was. Well, because these are, frankly, I mean, I know not everybody watching, you know, are GPs, but these are definitely questions I have in my office all the time. Do we treat? Do we not treat? These are the hard cases that walk in that are not straightforward. And at the end of the day, as clinicians, we just want to do what's right and, and operate with the best knowledge that we can. So listening to these conversations with lots of our other professionals that are doing things continues to keep our minds and our eyes open. And I, I think that's so important. Well, you know, it's, it's funny. You, you see these cases and you just don't know when to stop watching and start doing it, you know, and ultimately no matter who the endodontist is, it's, it's a matter of them knowing the science, understanding the science, but more importantly, it's a matter of communicating between us and the endodontist and communicating the patient's history, what we feel needs, you know, the, type of patient they're working on, you know, just there's so many things that we need to communicate and we need to be better at as, as a GP. So speaking of when, when Gary posted here, uh, saying what a great service we're doing for the profession. Um, you know, we had a lot of new fellows and masters that finished up this weekend in the AGD and, uh, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't send out a congratulatory, um, message to, and folks that studied and took the fellowship exam. This past weekend as well, you know, lots of dentists continuing to try to be best versions of their self of themselves in our profession. And it's just great to see in person 
um, education and in-person accolades, you know, returning back to a, a normal part of what we're doing. So congratulations to all the new fellows and masters in the academy. Yeah, what an incredible accomplishment. Yeah. So I totally agree. Congratulations. Yes. Congratulations. So um, Are we let's done? close it out. Yeah. Uh, once again, communicate with your specialist, whether it be an endodontist or any other specialist. Communicate, have an understanding of each other, spend time together, understand what they do, let them understand what you do. Um, I'd like to also really, really just give a heartfelt thanks to our sponsor, Q Optics. They've just been a phenomenal sponsor. But I, I would miss if I did not say that I want to thank Dennis Job Connect. I yeah. want to thank Doc Sites. I want to thank all the companies that have supported us in the past and the companies that will continue to support us. That's the way we keep this group going. I wish that I could say that we were making a million bucks, but the facts are we ain't not even close. We're just having a lot of fun and spreading our love for dentistry to all of you. So uh, Jeff, we missed you tonight. So much. Uh, we, we had a great speaker, Jeff, in case you missed it. But anyhow, uh, thanks everybody for being here. Really appreciate y'all. And uh, we'll see you next week. Good night. Good night, everybody. And that wraps up another podcast for Dennis in the Know. On behalf of Dr. Jennifer Bell, Dr. Chad Duplantis, and myself, remember that we've got a great profession. So let's make it a great day, dinks.